Okay, ready, set, tell me when. Hi everybody, this is Leadership at All Levels, Leadership Boot Camp. This is our third time together, second competency, big picture systems thinking, and we've just began. Began? Begun. We've just begun. Began. Begun. Begin. Anyways, somebody tell me something you're taking away from our first, or oh, that, that three week time frame, our last three weeks. Come on. Listening. How many people really tried to listen? Did you really try to listen? What did you notice about it? Hard. Okay, hard. <laughs> hard. Okay, somebody else. What did you notice? It actually made me stop for a minute, which I had trouble stopping because of my perfectionism. Okay, <laughs> right. And when you stopped and listened, even though it was hard, what did you find? You learned something. What's that? I heard a good negotiator, great negotiator, world famous negotiator said one time to me, Ian, there is no substitute for paying attention in the context of negotiation. No substitute for paying attention. How many of you agree with me there's probably no substitute in life for paying attention? We miss so much because we just don't pay attention, right? Okay, somebody else, listening. What did you take from the exercise of listening? That comment seems so like fundamental, but it's true, isn't it? That people are... <laughs> but, but it is. It is very true. As soon as you are focused, as soon as you are engaged, and as soon as you are, how many of you remember this from the, from the 90s, in the moment? Remember how many remember those workshops? Are you in the moment? Be in the moment, right? Those workshops. And then let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya, and we're in the moment. <laughs> Right, that whole thing. But it is amazing when you're in the moment, focused, paying attention, that people acknowledge that. People notice when you're paying attention. People do notice, don't they? Because they're so used to people not paying attention, not being engaged. Anybody else? Did it, did it make an impact? Anybody willing to share, did it make an impact when you did it at home? Did your spouse and children think you were drunk or something? Were they like... Are you on drugs? Why are you staring deeply into my eyes? <laughs> All right. Somebody else. Something else besides listening that you took away from the last few weeks. Who sent out the survey? Anybody send out a survey? Oh, very good participation. And what did you learn when you sent this survey out? Yes? Anybody? I didn't get people to give, I got, I think I wrote kind of a feedback. Okay. Mm. So she said it really struck her the importance of individual communication because you have so many different perspectives out there. Okay, somebody else that sent out your survey, what did you learn? You all raised your hand that you did it, so you can't not raise your and tell me about how it went. So that you already did well. So the thing that you thought you were going to need to work on, everybody said you did a good job of it. So that kind of struck you, interestingly enough, right? Wow, that's good, that's good right? So screw that thing. You're, you already mastered it. <laughs> yes? I was surprised that what I needed to work on professionally was the same as what I needed to work on personally. There was, mm. Mine was the same. I sent out 10, got three back. Different experience in that they were all pretty much the exact same comment. Very consistent. Very consistent. Okay. So it validated in your own mind the thing you need to do, and you now realize if you could get better at that, you're going to make a difference personal and professional. Yeah, yeah it was just interesting to see that the parallels were there. Mm -hmm. Who already knows what's coming next? Like if you looked out over the horizon of what's Ian got planned for us next, now that you've done those surveys, what do you think is coming next? Anybody know? Got to make some changes. And how many of you remember how are we going to, we're going to have to make a, anybody remember? A commitment. Yes. 
Right. Monday. Yeah. You're going to get an email. And in that email, there's going to be a button or a, a line. And it'll say, make your commitment. So if you recall, write down three names of people, uh, people's lives that would be better if you made a commitment. Then we did some introspection, right? Leadership history survey. Look within ourselves. And who is my best boss? Who is my worst boss? I'm the middle child. What does that really mean? Fetal position. Crying. Sad. Right? <laughs> or something like that. You want to hear something funny? I have not drank a sugar soda in six weeks. And I just decided to drink this. So like right now I am drunk. I swear <laughs> to God. I am totally drunk. But anyways, just completely ADD moment. So anyways, so introspection. And then, what's my communication style? Fact-based? Hmm, huh, what am I? And then, oh, wait a minute. Am I an energizer? Am I a researcher? What am I? What am I? What am I? And then survey. What does everybody think out? What does everybody else think I am? That is background then. Now I gotta pick out one thing. So this should be, to some degree, a well evaluated one thing. Three people told you what you need to work on. It v struck a chord in you and you said, well, that's what I need to work in my personal life too. Paula, you'd be a fool not to pick out that one thing, right? That a girl. So you're going to get the email. It'll have in there, pick out your one thing. You're going to click that. It'll bring you to a web page. You're going to fill the, what's your desired outcome, action plan, action steps, timelines, obstacles, accountability partners. Click send. That's going to come to me, and it's going to go back to you. Now, there's only two people that see that, me and you. If you choose to share it with somebody else, that's on you. I don't care, but I'm not sharing it. My staff doesn't even look at that. Only me. And then I'll respond back to you. Hey, that's a good commitment. Or, hey, that's kind of bogus, dude. What's that all about? You just said, I'm going to get better. Well, at what? And what's your plan? So I might push back on you, but know that if I do push back on you, it's not because I'm a jerk. I'm just, I'm reading it. Let's do this for real. Do we have to do it on Monday? No, but if, if by the time we have our next coaching session, in the middle of this three weeks, you haven't sent me a one thing, I'm probably going to start following up with you and give you some gentle nudges of, hey, where's your one thing? We can't, this cannot be a waste of time. It can't be a waste of time for you or for me. So pick out one thing, going to get better at it. Any questions about, your, about the one thing exercise? It is the most important part of this activity. Why is it the most important part of the activity? of this 15 weeks? Why is picking out one thing and working to get better at it the most important part of the exercise? Okay, you've committed to make a change. What else? Once I've learned to change, now I can, I'm good at changing because I've done it. Why else? How many people do you know at the age all of us are in the room that actually change anything in their life? of any meaning, of any substance. Let, let be honest. Do, do adults change very often, yes or no? no? No. So if you want to be a leader, leaders do things that others don't do. So one of the ways you step into leadership is I start doing things that others don't do. Ian's a leader. Why is Ian a leader? Because a lady walked up to me and said, help the children of Ghana. And I could have said, move away from my table. You're spitting on my spinach salad. And she wasn't spitting, but I was having spinach salad. Or I can say, hmm, children of Ghana, let me see what I can do. And then you just start picking it up along the way. Leaders do. So when you pick out one thing and nine weeks later you're better at it, everybody around you goes, wow, that was amazing. And I've just expanded my sphere of influence. In addition to that, I've learned how to change things. In addition to that, I've now created a pattern of being able to change things. I've raised my self-esteem. I've, I've, I've taken skills and put them into play. It's a real world learning experience. So don't look at me and say, oh, kind of, Ian, it's a trite exercise. I don't have time. It's not a trite exercise. There's depth and breadth to it, okay? All right. <coughs> Any other comments about the last three weeks or questions? Comments or questions about the last three weeks before we launch into the next three weeks? 
All right. The next three weeks, before I go into it, let me just preface it by saying this. I will give you more information than you can assimilate. You will not be able to, to, to take in all the information that we give you over the next three weeks. That will not be doable. So don't even try. There's going to be a ton of information. Pick and choose the information that's most relevant to you and that you think would most interest you, engage you, or help you. And then later come back and pick up the other stuff. Because Joe, how, how much time do you have to access this information once the program is done? Anybody know? How much time do you have to access the information till you can't access the learning portal anymore? Does anybody know? What's that? Infinite. That's right. You have forever. So this doesn't go away. So the Leadership Boot Camp 1 people can go into that portal all the time. You can go into this portal all the time. Forever. Even after you leave, you'll be able to access the information. You just change your username, change your email address, and you can just access it forever. That's our commitment to you. So you're going to have more information than you can possibly access or assimilate. Just focus on what is important to you and then go back and get the rest later. The competency that we're going to talk about for the next three weeks is big picture, holistic systems thinking. But I got to give you some background so you'll understand what it means. I think in today's day and age that there's not enough time, energy, or effort available to you to get done everything you need to get done. How many of you agree there's not enough time, energy, or effort available to you to get done everything you need to get done? Raise your hand if you agree with that. Okay. I felt like that. <clears throat> and I felt like that because throughout my life, I have been asked to do things that I'm not capable of doing. I've been in, elevated in, or promoted into positions that I didn't have the experience for, the talent for, the education of, or the background. I've been put in positions of leadership that I did not have the capacity to do. And that has been kind of routine in life for me. It's like doing you know, international project. I ain't got, what do I know about doing an international project? Right? I don't know nothing about it. But here we go, help the children of Ghana. And it's been like that a lot. And in my professional career specifically, most of the time I've been leading people that were significantly older than me or had been in the industry significantly longer than me. So that set up a unique dynamic and the unique dynamic sounded something like this, oh my God, I don't know what to do. That was routinely my drive home. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to lead this. I don't know how to help these people. I'm overwhelmed. And that was routine, routine. To the point of like nervous breakdown at one point, like crying, like on my bed crying. I don't know how to do this. 1,100 people are asking me, I don't know what to do. And I've always been this kind of motivational guy because I was a jock and so I like little quotes. So in one of those, I don't know what to do, I can't make it, I don't have what it takes, I should just quit, everybody would be better if I just left moments, I started flipping through this book of quotes trying to look for something that would kind of lift me and pick me up. And I came across a quote. It goes like this. Give me a place to stand and I will move the world. It was attributed to a guy named Archimedes. Archimedes was a mathematician. He was one of the fathers of geometry. He was an inventor. He invented the compound pulley, the concept of buoyancy, and the fulcrum and the lever. You ever seen a fulcrum and lever? You know, you put a rock down, you put a stick on top of the rock, and then you can lift something else really heavy. Anybody ever seen that? Well, he, he came up with that. Archimedes. Give me a place to stand and I will move the world. I was like, yeah, give me a place to stand and I will move the world. I can do anything. Ian, you're silly. Well, yeah, that's true. But it got me all fired up. And so I was so intrigued by the quote that I started to do some research. Who was Archimedes and what was he talking about and what was the context of that comment? Well, interestingly enough, the context of that comment was he was talking about his fulcrum and lever. He was saying, you know, if I have a fulcrum big enough and I have a lever strong enough, a pole or a piece of steel or iron, if you just give me a place to stand, I can move just about anything. And it dawned on me. 
he wasn't talking about the human capacity. He was talking about the tool. He was saying, give me a place to stand and with the right tool, I can do just about anything. Oh, I don't understand, Ian. What, what's your point? It dawned on me that success in life was less about talent and ability and more about utilizing the right tools. That I didn't need to be brilliant. I didn't need to be talented. I didn't need to have a bunch of fancy letters after my name. I didn't have to be highly educated. It didn't matter the family I came from or the color of my skin. It mattered the tool. Did I use or was I using the appropriate tool for the appropriate time? Fulcrum and lever. Because through the fulcrum and lever, if I had a, a 400 pound rock here, utilizing the fulcrum and lever, could I move it, yes or no? Yes or no? Yes, I could. I could. I could do more than I'm capable of because I have the right tool. So if you feel overwhelmed and there's not enough time, the question is, do you have an effective tool for, for managing your time? Or do you have an effective tool for motivating other people, including yourself? So it, it started me down this walkway of systems thinking. Because see, his compound pulley, everybody know what a compound pulley is? It's a series of gears or a series of pulleys and rope that allow a one man to do more than 10 men in some instances. And the first time he tested it, there was a boat in the harbor. And that boat had been pulled into shore by 10 men the day before. And Archimedes, an old frail man, pulled that boat into shore, one guy, because he had the right system. And it started taking me down this path of systems thinking. And I read the, the writings of Senge and others. And basically the point that they made was that the whole world is a system. Doesn't it freak you out that a big ball of fire in the sky, a million kilometers away, if it moved a centimeter this way or a centimeter that way, it would completely change our existence? And even though we're not connected in any way, it's the solar system. How about your body? Your body is a system. Do you have to think about your heart beating? Do you have to think about your eyes blinking? Do you think, do you have to, to concentrate and be like, blood go to my feet, blood, go, do you have to do that? No, you don't have to do any of that because it's a system. It's a system. I still don't get it, Ian. Okay, I'll make it clearer for you. This is how it works in the workplace. I don't know, it's just what we do around here. Have you ever heard that? I don't know, just, I don't know why we do, I don't know why we do it it's just what we do around here. Raise your hand if you've heard that before or an attitude like that. That's because systems can either organically grow up and take hold or they can be developed for a purpose. Okay, but what's a system? A system is just a deeply integrated set of parts that were organized and integrated for a specific purpose. That's a system. But systems can organically take hold. Uh, this is even more vivid. I am so happy to be having this baby. My mom had me when she was 15, and her mom had her when she was 15, and here I am, 15. Systems. Systems. Either organically take up or were intentionally developed for a purpose. They can be tangible, like that thermostat over there. That's a tangible system. Or they can be intangible, social systems. I mean, I, I, I even make it more vivid. How many of you are completely satisfied with the youth that our society are turning out every day? Raise your hand if you think that we are doing an excellent job of building the citizen of tomorrow. Oh, interestingly, no hands go up. How many of you would agree that we could probably do a little bit of work as a society in building the citizen of tomorrow? You know why? You know why we are, we are unsatisfied? Because we don't have a good system. There is no integration of the educational system, the youth serving organizations, the faith based organizations, the athletic organizations, the art organizations. Are they all in alignment utilizing resources to meet the objective of building the citizen of tomorrow? Do we have attributes and qualities that we'd like to see from our citizens of tomorrow and then have definite programs and processes to build those? Yes or no? No. We leave it to chance. We allow it to organically grow up. 
How many agree with me the citizen of tomorrow is being developed every day? And it's organically being developed, not intentional. How about this right here in Fort McMurray? Would you agree with me that if I'm a new citizen or resident to Fort McMurray, and whether new means Newfoundland or new means Mumbai or Manila, are the way that we bring new community members in is probably poor at best. And then we wonder why people don't feel like a part of community. System. If you're not completely satisfied with life, it probably is a system issue. Now what's funny is, we try to solve problems by looking at slivers of the system. Slivers. We don't realize that everything is connected, that there's a symbiotic relationship. Peter, right? Mm -hmm. Peter, how long have you lived in Fort McMurray? Uh, 31 years. 31 years. Okay, where do you live in Fort McMurray? In Thickwood. Okay, Thickwood. And let's say I live on the other side of town. And I'm a guy who uh, sells drugs. I've fathered three kids, none of which I financially take care of. And I do petty crime. I got a job out in camp, but I, mostly I'm generating revenue by selling drugs to all the other yahoos that are here. Is my behavior impact you? Yes. Well, we never see each other. We never meet. We're not connected in any way. Does my behavior impact you? In a positive or negative way? Negative way. Negative way, he said. Okay, let's say I live on the other side of town. We never meet. We never talk to. I got three kids, but I work two jobs to support them. I don't have much time to volunteer because I'm working hard, but when I do, I support my little place of faith or I volunteer at the boys and girls thing or I help with the seniors or whatever. Is my choices in lifestyle good or bad for you? Good. What? Good. Good. Positively impact you, even though we aren't connected in any way? That's called a symbiotic relationship. So today's leader recognizes and realizes that there's not enough time, energy, or effort at their disposal to get done everything they need to get done. They realize that Archimedes was right. I got to have great systems if I'm going to be successful. And that there must be a holistic approach. We're connected. Finally, that systems either organically grow up and take hold or they're intentionally developed for a specific purpose. But even in this one, do we have to keep going back and making sure that that system is still relevant? How many of you have ever seen a system within RMWB, within your organization, that was developed for a specific purpose and that purpose is gone now? But we still do it that way. Has anybody ever experienced that? So that's the tough part about systems. They organically take hold, but even when you develop them for a specific purpose, you have to constantly be asking, is it still relevant? Is it still relevant? Is it still relevant? My goal over the next three weeks is to get you to start thinking systems-based. Now, systems does not just mean systematic or systemic, sequential. It doesn't just mean that. It means symbiotic. It means holistic. It means that even though Peter and I don't live each, near each other, our lives impact each other. It's a whole different way of thinking. It's moving from hierarchy to network. It's moving from analysis to creation. It's moving from tangible to intuitive. That's what the 21st century calls for, in my opinion. Now, how are we going to do this? I'm going to try to introduce some systems to you that will hopefully make you more effective at what you do and in life. In other words, fulcrum and lever, fulcrum and lever. Try to introduce some fulcrums and levers into your life so that you can move more than you could do on your own. Write this down, force multipliers. We're gonna introduce some systems that are force multipliers. A bicycle, is a bicycle a system, yes or no? A bicycle is a system, it's a human mechanical interface a human mechanical interface a bicycle will allow you and I to go 20 30 40 maybe even 50 kilometers an hour on a bicycle yes or no yes. yeah could I do that in my own power it is a force multiplier the fulcrum and lever is a force multiplier the compound pulley is a force multiplier Brett can do more with less Fulcrum, lever, bicycle, force multipliers. You know what else is a force multiplier? 
an effective time management strategy is a force multiplier. All of a sudden, it seems like it's too much in my week to get done, but I become more effective of maximizing the use of my time, and not only am I able to get that done, but get more done. Can everybody see how time management or effective utilization of your time could be a force multiplier? Can you all see that? How about this? Coming up with a creative idea. If Kelly can become more creative, would that be like a fulcrum and lever in her life or potentially? Yes or no? So what I'm going to attempt to do is introduce a number of systems to you over the next three weeks in an attempt to do two things. One, make your life better, hopefully. And two, get you to think in terms of systems. I want you to be able to walk out into your neighborhood and see the systems that are in play. Or I want you to be able to walk into the workplace and see the systems that have organically grown up and taken hold or were developed for a specific purpose but are no longer relevant. When you improve systems, what do you think happens? What happens when you improve systems? Why is improving systems better than improving an individual? Well, I don't want to say better. More impactful. I help this one person, and that's cool, but when I improve the system, how many do I impact? How many? Whole community, all the stakeholders. So systems. If all of a sudden we got really, really good in Fort McMurray of bringing in people from other places, making them feel a part of the community, and normally that took a year and now we cut it to five months, would that make a significant impact in the whole community, yes or no? Financially, morally, socially, yes or no? Yes. Or I can just spend one person at a time. Now, I'm not discouraging one person at a time. I'm not saying that. System. If you can figure out a way to get paper from here to there more efficiently within RMWB for contractors, for vendors, for whatever, would that have a significant impact, yes or no? So what if all of you people became systems thinkers? And why you, Lisa? Why is it so important that the people in this room become systems thinkers? Why is it so critical? Even more critical, well, I don't want to say more critical, but, but the impact could even be more significant than somebody like Glenn. Anybody know? Because we're from everywhere. Because you're from everywhere, but why else? Why you? Why is it important that you be systems thinkers? How long have you been doing what you've been doing? Six years. Six years. You think you've put 10,000 hours in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we know it's about 2,000 hours a year. You've put in five. What does it take to get a PhD? Anybody know? 10,000 hours. That means you have a PhD at what you do. Operational and vocational expertise. All of you in the room have operational and vocational expertise. So if we can get you to start thinking the systems, you take that operational expertise, you get systems thinking, you'll create better systems. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And better systems impact exponentially. So that's why it's important that all of us in the room learn how to be better systems thinkers. All right, tell me what you think. What is, what is this... What resonates with you in this while I get this young lady a handout? So somebody tell me, what are you thinking about? When I talk to you about this, somebody tell me something you're taking away. You owe me $2. You can give it to me later or tomorrow or whenever. And you know what? You gave me your $2. What was your name again? Helen. Helen. How honest is that? That's pretty good. Well, who are we donating this to? To Ghana? Okay, there you go. $2. That's like 10 bucks in Ghana, right there. Somebody tell me something you're taking away. So, introduce this concept of systems thinking. First of all, have any of you done any reading or research or heard of these concepts before? Raise your hand, yes or no. Okay, a couple of you. So, what would be to your advantage, or what would be the impact, what do you think the impact could be for you if you got better at what we're talking about? systems thinking somebody come on 
Absolutely. More done in less time and probably less stressful. Okay, somebody else. What could be the advantage for you? Better understand your role? Absolutely. Somebody else. Be able to motivate people better because they see it as well, right? Okay, be able to motivate people better. What else? Tangible outcomes. You feel like you got more bang for your buck. Absolutely get more bang for your buck. Like you could fix and improve? You would be able to fix and improve things more efficiently and effectively? I think so. Now, be clear. A pile of rocks is not a system. If I took one rock out of the pile of rocks, that is not a system. A car engine is a system. If I take the carburetor out of the car engine, the car engine will no longer work. So if you're starting to think in your mind, what's a system, what's a system? Pile of rocks, no. Car engine, yes. Is it a process, Ian? Are processes, when we talk in our workplace about processes, are they systems? They are a part of a system, but multiple processes usually make up the holistic system. So what I need you to do is not just look at your one process, but how the process you're developing impacts all the processes within your department and how that impacts another department and another department and another department. That's systems thinking. Holistic, big picture systems thinking. So that the decisions I make here, I see how they impact beyond me and beyond my group. And how when we do something, it impacts over there. That was my point of the analogy between us living in the same town but never seeing each other or coming in contact. My behaviors and my life choices do impact him. But Ian, is it just sequence? Not necessarily. It, it, it might just be connectivity, not necessarily sequence. If any parts of the system are misaligned or broken, the system will fail. So if we're not completely satisfied with the youth that we're turning out, probably got a system issue. If you're not completely satisfied with what's going on in your personal life, probably got a system issue. Well, but relationships, how is that system? Well, we've already talked in the first six weeks about some systems of better communication, haven't we? We just didn't call it that. But we did talk about a system of better communication. So... So intangibles are systems-based as well, even though it just takes a little bit of thought to get there. All right, turn to the quick survey. I want you to take this quick survey on this page right here. So the competency, big picture, holistic systems thinking. The indicators, I'm going to read them. One, I'm totally not like that. Ten, I'm totally like that. Go through it, circle them up. You don't have to follow along with me. I'm just going to read them randomly. And then you circle, when I see your pen go down, your eyes come up, I'll know you're done. I understand there's a symbiotic relationship between human beings. I can apply strategies for learning about those in my group, and key stakeholders, and its resources. I demonstrate knowledge of the roles and responsibilities of myself, my fellow employees in the department and greater community, to the greater community. I demonstrate knowledge of how I personally connect to the bigger picture. I can apply techniques that will generate creative, out-of-the-box thinking. I'm aware that my time is perishable, a perishable commodity, and have an urgency about its use. I'm aware of my, cult, my department's culture. I support collaboration amongst my team. I see things in a holistic view. I see how I personally affect my team, the department, the community, and beyond. I have strategies to motivate myself and others. Oh, you need one too? There you go. Oh, take that one. No, yeah, I got one back there. I got another one for the children of Ghana. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, once you're, once you're done, pick up your eyes and let me know once you've gone through it. Okay. Now the whole point, point of taking those little self-surveys is so you can focus your energy for three weeks. You'll kind of pick out where you need to grow or where you want to learn. Score yourself 10, 1, or something in between. 10, 1, or something in between. <laughs> Okay, 
So in my life experience, may not be your life experience, but in my life experience, it was very freeing. This idea of Archimedes, this idea of systems thinking was very freeing because all of a sudden now, it wasn't all based on my skill, my talent, or pixie dust that was sprinkled on my head. It wasn't all based on that. It was based on choice and system. I had a choice of the systems I used. I could choose to use more effective ones and I could choose to establish them in my life. Done. It wasn't about the color of my skin, gender, bank account, none of that mattered. What mattered was what's the system the times require, go get the system, apply the system. And that all of a sudden became very freeing for me. Now it was just a matter of go getting good systems. Now some of you in the room are trained systems thinkers. Engineers are trained systems thinkers. They're outcome-based thinkers, but it's rare. Most of us have not been trained to think in this way. So it does begin with our patterns of thinking, the sequence we think through. Have any of you met somebody in your life that they just seem to always just make bad decisions? Not that they like make bad choices, they're totally in drugs, or they always have, hang out with the wrong person, but just, just like, they always were like, yeah, I tried this business and it failed, and I tried to invest and that didn't work, and I bought that boat and it sucked, and I mean, they just make bad decisions, right? Well, I would suggest to you it's probably because of the decision-making system they use. The sequence of how they evaluate a decision. They ask themselves this, and then they ask themselves this, or they ask themselves this, and then they get to a conclusion. All research shows that our patterns of thinking dictate our outcome. So over the next three weeks, I'm going to try to unpack four systems for you. One, and we're going to talk about it today, and we're going to start with it today. How do you come up with a great idea? We're going to talk about coming up with a great idea or being an innovative thinker. Time, we're going to talk for all next week. The whole week, we're going to talk about time. It's going to start with a half hour training. And that half hour training, I'll give you three days to watch. So 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And then we'll have a couple more uh, videos, short ones on Thursday and Friday, and then an exercise. Because the following week, you're going to track your time. Where does my time go? There is no more perishable commodity in your life than time. 60 minutes to an hour, 24 hours in a day, and 168 hours in a week, and that's the one thing that winners and losers have in common. It's about what do you do with your time? Can you maximize the utilization of your time? Motivation, we'll talk about it in a moment. C can you motivate yourself? Can you motivate another human being? It's the most over-discussed, misunderstood part of leadership misunderstood, over-discussed motivation. And then finally, we'll give you a system of more effective and impactful communication. Now, there's no way you could possibly go through all of that over four weeks or three weeks. We're going to post videos, and then you can go in and, and, and attack the ones that you think are most relevant to you or come back and get, get after them later and down the road, okay? So first, let's start with thinking. Somebody tell me how you come up with a great idea. Somebody tell me, how do you, right now, when you've got to come up with a great idea, how do you come up with a great idea? What do you do? What's that? Okay, define the problem. So your first step is define the problem. And then when your first step is define the problem. Then what do you do? <laughs> so you raise your hand and say, we have a problem! And everybody's like, what do you want to do about that? I have no idea! But somebody better fix this! Is that it? All of your coworkers around you are like, yeah, that's pretty much what she does. <laughs> so, somebody else, how do you come up with a great idea? Brainstorming. Brainstorming. Tell me about that. Who said that? Okay, so what do you do? So everybody sits down, and you say, hey, we got to take on this challenge. And then you're like, okay, let's have some ideas. Come on. And everybody's like, oh, we could do this, and we could do that. And then you write them down on the wall, maybe four pieces of paper. And then do you kind of sift through the best of those? And you pick out the best of those, and then you do some action steps. Yeah? 
How many say that's pretty reasonable? Not bad. Pretty good. All right. Anybody else? Besides that brainstorming approach, anybody else? Yes. Okay, so he would add to that, go get more information, go do some research, go to the University of Google, the University of Yahoo, go get some information, all right? Anybody else? What's that? Okay, what do I want the outcome to be? All right, These are, how many of you agree with me? All? Okay. So I found that I was not very innovative, nor very creative. No creativity, no innovation in me. Sitting at tables like this, group of people, we're brainstorming, and I never had a good idea. All these people always had better ideas than I did. And that became very frustrating to me. And I thought to myself, well, it can't just be you're born creative or born innovative. This has got to be a learned trait. So I started doing and searching and looking. And I came to the research of a guy named Dr. Ludwig. University of Texas down in the States. And Dr. Ludwig agreed with me. Dr. Ludwig said it's actually your sequence of thinking. That this is the way that most people work to come up with a creative idea. They usually start with this. Okay, if we have this much stuff, time, talent, treasure, whatever, money, resources, we have this much, then we could do these activities. And if we did these activities, then we could have this outcome. And if we had this outcome, we could have this impact. Would you agree with me that's typical, right? If we had this much stuff, we could do this many things, and if we did this many things, we could have this result, and if we had this result, we'd have this impact on what we want. Would you agree that's pretty typical? Even in the brainstorming sessions, that's pretty typical. What do you see when you look at that? Is there any flaw to that? What's the flaw to that right off the bat? You're limited to your existing situation. Are you going to come up with anything innovative if you work off of what you have right now, yes or no? Well, the likelihood is slim. And that was the point that Dr. Ludwig made. Dr. Ludwig made, said that all of those activities, brainstorming sessions, whatever you want to call them, usually work off of what do we have right now. And if we're working off of what we have right now, it's probably not going to be innovative. He said you had to flip it. So what I did was I took the following pattern of thinking or sequence of questioning or steps, put them on a three by five card and went to every meeting I went to with it for a year. So every meeting for a year I took the three by five card with the following steps on it. Let's walk through those steps. A new sequence of thinking that will lead you to more creative ideas. Step number one. What do I want it to be? What do I want it to be? What do I want it to be? So for the engineers in the room, you're saying, oh, outcome-based planning. Yes, outcome-based outcome planning. That was the first thing you said, right? You got to think about what you want it to be first. I don't know where I'm going if I don't know where I'm going. Exactly. I want it to be. And remember when we talked about building trust? Remember it said you build trust by being an outcome-based thinker? Outcome-based thinkers, you trust more because they're starting with what they want it to be first. So they're able to explain it to you. So outcome-based thinkers are more trustworthy. Is this like reverse engineering? It would be kind of like reverse engineering. Outcome-based. What do I want it to be first? And then creating a critical path to get there. But there are some nuances to it. So what do I want it to be? And one of the nuances is this. What does it look like, smell like, feel like, taste like? Why am I using those descriptors? Why would I want you to be able to explain what you want the outcome to be in the detail of those level of descriptors? Tangible. It's tangible. What else? Why else? That level of looks like, smells like, feels like, tastes like. What is visualization. visualization. Senses. Because when I can explain it to that degree, there's a greater likelihood that Kelly will buy in. 
when I can explain what it smells like, feels like, looks like, tastes like, then Peter's more likely to understand. So for all of us in the room, you are getting a better understanding of how you communicate, your style and the like. You're getting a better understanding of those that work around you. Oh, and on a side note, how many of you have supervisors or managers that are in the program in the other class? Anybody? Go to them and say, what are you? Because they just took the exercise this week. The leadership style inventory, they are just doing that this week. So go to them, because this is accountability. Go to them and say, well, are you an energizer? And if they go, I don't know what you're talking about. You got to say to them, uh, dude, you got an email on Monday. How come you haven't done the exercise? I'm Ian's accountability partner. If they did do it, because many of them did, it gives you an opportunity to say, I'm an energizer. You're a researcher. We should be able to better understand each other. So what do I want it to be, smell like, feel like, look like, taste like, gives you better sense of buy-in. That exercise where you tried to find out if you were an energizer or a researcher and you find out what your boss is, greater opportunity for alignment. So what do I want it to be? From now on, every meeting that you come to, every situation that you're in, the first thing you're thinking to yourself, what do I want out of this? What do I want it to end up like? Number two, where are we at today? Where are we at today? Underneath that, write this, courageous conversation. Write courageous conversation. Where are we at today? Courageous conversation. What do you think I mean by courageous conversation? People have to admit where you're lacking. Okay. People have to admit where they're lacking or where the group is lacking. Have you ever sat in that brainstorming meeting? Manager comes in. Okay, guys, well, you, as you all know, we've got a problem. We're going to solve this problem. We're all going to do it. I've got the whiteboard up. We're just going to throw out ideas for the next 20 minutes. Let's go. Okay, ready, set, go. And people start throwing out ideas. Oh, that's a great idea. Role play. Role play with me. High five. Role play. That a gal. Good job. Took a second. We were role playing. We're role playing. We're brainstorming. That was a good idea. Good job, Alice. So we're all, we're all brainstorming. And, yeah, that was, oh, good job, Peter. And oh, that's right, Paula. And oh, that's awesome, Callie. Okay, woo. And all of you are sitting there in your minds and you're saying to yourself, you know what? We have yet to talk about what the real problem is. Have you ever sat in that meeting? Yes. We have yet to talk about the real problem. That's because we're not willing to have a courageous conversation. What's a courageous conversation? A courageous conversation is where the five or six of us sit down, we talk about the problem, but not in an attempt to find out whose fault it is. That's a key ingredient. Not in an attempt to find out whose fault it is. So we discuss it, we dialogue it, we talk it out. And he and I aren't protecting ourselves. We're just talking about the truth of the matter. So one, we're not trying to find out whose fault it is. Two, we're only talking about what matters. And three, it, we only talk about the past in the context or in the attempt to better the future. We're not talking about the past just to bring out all the times we've been screwed over or there's been injustice or whatever. We only talk about the past to ensure that we can make good decisions moving forward. Courageous conversation. Would you agree with me, and this isn't an indictment on anybody, but would you agree with me there needs to be some courageous conversations within your department? Raise your hand. Okay? Would you agree with me there needs to be some courageous conversations in the organization? Would you say there needs to be some courageous conversations in our community? Right. How about our nation? Yeah. Where we really talk about what matters, but we don't try to figure out whose fault it is. Would you also agree with me every time you turn on CBC News or CTV and you see politicians going at it, very few of them are having courageous conversations? Because every conversation revolves around whose fault it is. Which doesn't really, let's just fix the problem. Let's get to the problem. Fix it and move on. Then we can come back later and, right? Okay, number three. And this goes to your reverse engineering comment, right? Isn't this like reverse engineering? It is with some nuances. And this is one, another one of the nuances. Number one, what do I want it to be? 
Number two, where are we at today? Courageous conversation. Number three, what attitudes would have to shift? What attitudes would have to shift to get me from where we're at to what we could potentially become? What attitudes would have to shift? Why am I, why am I inserting this attitude identification, excuse me, attitude identification at this point in the questioning? Sequence of questions to get me to a creative idea or a creative way or a creative approach. Why am I inserting, hey, because normally, what we, even if you did reverse engineering, what do I want it to be? Where are we at today? At some, you'd say, well, what resources do we need to get from here to there? But before we can talk resources and action steps, we have to identify attitudes. Why? Because the ad, he said, get the obstacles out of the way, or at least identify them. Because the attitudinal obstacle is the strongest. The attitudinal obstacle is the most challenging. The attitudinal obstacle. Anybody in IT in the room? Anybody in IT? Okay. When you've rolled out a new software package into a department, if the department is attitudinally against you doing it, how hard is it for you? How hard? What did you say it out loud? Almost impossible. Let's say they're totally on board attitudinally, but they have very little technical skill. How is it to do it? Fairly easy. Tremendous technical skill, totally against doing it attitudinally. How hard is it? Almost impossible. No technology background or knowledge, but totally into doing it. How is it? Fairly easy. Attitudinal barriers. So when putting together my innovative idea, I got to address the attitudinal barriers that may be presented. Yeah, Ian, this is fine for intangible things, but this doesn't have to do with money. What if, what, if our, what if we needed to overcome the challenge of not enough money? Well, let me ask you this. In Fort McMurray, Alberta, in regional municipality Wood Buffalo, from, from Fort Chip down to Jean Vier or Anzac or Conklin or whatever, if the right seven attitudes became favorable to the thing you want to do, how many agree with me you'd get plenty of money? Am I right or wrong about that? So is it about money or is it about attitudes? Just within your department, within RMWB. If the right seven people within RMWB shine favorably upon you, would you get what you wanted, yes or no? Yes. Now, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, good or bad. I'm just saying that's life. So for me, attitudes are important. They can make things almost impossible or they can make them fairly easy. So don't I need to do some pre-qualification or pre-evaluation before I try to come up with my innovative idea? Fourth, what activities, activities could shift the attitude? What activity could shift the attitude? Your willingness to change. I don't know. I just have to ask the question. You see, I'm asking questions, right? This is a series of questions or a sequence or a systems of questions that will get me to a creative idea. And you might be right. Maybe the attitude, the first thing that needs activities, I gotta shift my own attitude. But it might be a situation where I have distrust, mistrust, misinformation, misunderstanding. I gotta figure that out before I dive into it. And then finally, how much? What resources? So what resources? Would we need to do those activities, to shift those attitudes, to take us from where we're at to what we could potentially become? So I've basically done this. Here's what I want it to be. Here's where we are today. Keep up, James. That a boy. That's what I want it to be. Here we are today. What attitudes will stand in my way? And then what activities could I do to get around those attitudes or through those attitudes? And then what resources would I need to create the critical path from here to there? So to a degree, you are right. It is reverse engineering. However, it takes in the human factor into account. Practically speaking, anybody ever heard of Jane and Finch? 
What's Jane and Finch besides two names of two streets? It's in Toronto, and, and you said bad area. Okay, yeah. at one point or another, it had the highest murder rate in all of Canada. Jane and Finch. Jane and Finch. St. Charles Gagne School sits one block north of Jane and Finch. St. Charles Gagne School. St. Charles Gagne School has 68 languages spoken in that school. 68 languages. Would you, would you say it's tough to be the principal at St. Charles Gagne School? And so we wanted to engage the community, and we wanted to get the community more involved. So we were going to build a playground, two playgrounds at St. Charles Gagne School. The problem with building the playground is, would we get anybody to show up? Nobody knows each other. No one talks to each other. How are we going to get everybody to show up? So the desired outcome was, we need to reduce crime by building trust. So the impact, reduction of crime. The outcome, greater trust, right? So we're going to build a playground. Everybody work together, and they'll have a shared experience and feel good. High fives all around. Woo, we did it. We helped our kids. Yay. But how many of you know we weren't going to get anybody to show up? No one's going to show up. So we had to figure out a way to market it. How are we going to market this thing? How are we going to get people to show up? And the first idea sounded like this. We'll create a flyer. Yeah, but there's 68 languages. Oh, okay. So on one side we'll put English and on the other side we'll put French. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is seriously the brainstorming session that I'm sitting in. And I'm like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Luigi raises his hand, assistant principal at the school, and says the following. I got an idea. Now remember, he's following the sequence. What do we want it to be? Trust-based, reduction of crime. Where is it at today? Nobody trusts each other. They're all from different places, speak different languages. They don't get along. Not because they hate each other, they just don't know each other. What do we got to do? We got to engender trust. How are we going to do that? Well, we got to shift these attitudes. So here's what his idea. To market. He said, well, why don't we go to the ethnic restaurants? What, Luigi? Well, like, why don't we go to the Somali restaurant and the Filipino restaurant and all these different Arabic restaurants? Why don't we go to all the restaurants, talk to the restaurant owners, talk to the waitresses and waiters, explain to them exactly what we're doing so that they'll talk about what we're doing in their native tongue, in their native culture, in, their, in a place that they trust. How many say that's a brilliant idea? Brilliant. Brilliant. Now, we had budgeted like $10,000 for flyers, for radio, commercial, la, 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 la. And Luigi's like, let's just go to the place that they would trust, communicate it, and then let it be communicated amongst their community. So we did it. 600 people showed up. 600 people showed up to build those two playgrounds, community garden, the whole thing. Lieutenant Governor Bartleman showed up with 2,500 books, and we honored... Um, a fallen soldier named Answorth Dreyer on that day. Now, is that brilliant? Well, I don't know if it's brilliant or if it's just a sequence. Luigi just did this. And he came up with an innovative way to market. Would you say that's innovative? Highly effective? And how much did it cost? A little bit of food, right? We all ate all kinds of different food for a couple of weeks. So what I would strongly encourage you to do is first... Ask yourself, what is the approach that I'm using to come up with a good idea? Or what is the approach that I use to make a decision? Now, in your line of work, you've been taught certain decision-making sequences if you're an incident commander, right? Is that right or wrong? So, and I don't know all the particulars, but I know that through your training, you learn how to make decisions. If I got this and I got that and I got to weigh these things, I make decisions, right? And why are you trained to do that? I'm not trained to do that. But why is you in your, in your profession? Uh, well, obviously because lives are at stake. Exactly. Because lives are at stake. Pilots. Pilots receive the same training. Doctors receive the same training. So a pilot goes through a certain sequence every single time. No matter, even if they've flown a, a million hours every single time because lives are at stake. So I would strongly encourage you, if you don't like this sequence, ah, I think that's kind of dumb, then go tonight to the University of Google and type in critical thinking skills. 
innovative thinking approaches, how to come up with a great idea so that you have it in your toolkit. Why is it so important for you to be able to come up with a great idea? How many of you have ever worked for a boss that their ideas were always dumb? No, we laugh, but walk this out with me. And you even questioned, listen, you even questioned the organization for putting them in the position of leadership. And you started to doubt the credibility of the organization because why would they hire this Yahoo to be in charge? How many of you can honestly say you've done that before? This is really, 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 really important for you to catch. When, when creating organizational culture, system, followers must believe that their leaders are credible. So that when they sit in a meeting and hear dumb ideas routinely come out of their leaders' mouths, they start saying this, why am I believing in this organization? These people are yahoos. That idea makes no sense. Now, I'm not saying that's what you experience, but can you see where that comes from, yes or no? Yes or no? So, if Alice really wants to be a leader, she sits in meetings and comes up with good ideas. And whether she has a title or not, if she sat in a meeting with you and routinely, more times than not, came up with good ideas, would you start to be influenced by her, yes or no? Ew, yes! That's my point. So you're building trust in the first three weeks. Now we're coming up with good ideas. I'm a trustworthy person that always has good ideas. Are you going to become a person of influence in a very short period of time, yes or no? Yes. But I know inherently most of you in the room have not been trained how to come up with a good idea because you're resource-based thinkers. If we have this much time, this much energy, we can only do this many things. So I'm just getting you to flip it. I don't like it. Fine, you don't like it. I'm okay with that then go get a good go get away get a system for creating a good idea make sure it's sequential that way it's consistent and can be learned make sure it's something you can teach to someone else so that when you get to a position of leadership you're going to teach all of your followers how to come up with good ideas so that you'll always look like a hero cuz your department always comes up with good ideas because you taught you took the time to teach people how to come up with a good idea then it's not just incumbent upon you to come up with good ideas. Everybody's coming up with a good idea. And all we need is one every six months to keep people off our backs. All we need is one every six months to keep people off our backs. Am I right or wrong? You come up with a good idea once every six months, everybody will leave you alone. Right? Everybody will leave you alone. So this thing is a lot more, this thing is a lot more than just you coming up with an innovative, creative idea that wows everybody at the table. It's about trust and engendering trust amongst your people around you and the people who eventually you'll be leading. When people think they're being led by someone who's not creative or innovative, they begin to doubt their leadership capacity. When they're being led by someone who's innovative and creative, they're more al likely to give allegiance. I will give you my time, talent, and treasure because you seem to be damn creative. And you're always coming up with cool stuff. Used to think that was pixie dust. Somebody sprinkled it on your head. No, no, no. Archimedes, give me a place to stand and I will move the world. I just gave you a tool. But if you don't like it, find another one. That's fine. Just get one. All right, turn the page. Let's talk about another system. Remember, so my attempt over the next couple days, my attempt over the next couple days is to just give you systems. Introduce systems to you. Various systems. Go to this page right here. And then we'll finish up with time. But let's just go to this one right here. Somebody tell me how you motivate somebody. Somebody tell me the system you use currently to motivate your kids or motivate your, motivate your husband or spouse or whatever. Okay? Okay. Bribery. Bribery is a good one. Bribery is a good one. Okay? Somebody else. What's that? 
So, okay, so your explanation reson go ahead. Okay, so you're going to try to get in alignment what they're hoping to be and achieve with what you're hoping to be and achieve. Okay, very good. So you're trying to connect with what they want to do. All right, somebody else. Okay, your passion, your energy will motivate them. What is motivation? Somebody define motivation for me. What's the definition? Isn't it funny, it's one of those words we use a lot, but then when someone asks you what does it mean, you're like, uh... Okay, so he said, he said that motivation is a positive attitude for action. What's that? Okay, possibly. He pushed back. He, belt, he backed up on it. As soon as I questioned him, he's like, well, I don't know if exactly that's what I mean. <laughs> because I have a feeling you're going to jump my ass now, so no. I don't know if I think that's the definition. That was good. Here's the definition in simplest terms. Motivation. That which moves me into action. That's it. Motivation is just that which moves me into action. So if I want to be a great motivator, I have the ability to get this young man into action. I can get Brent into action. I can get Lisa into action. I can get Alice into action. I can get Peter into action. To be an effective leader today, I better be able to move people into action. Now, for many of you, autobiographically, this would be the motivational approach that you had most experienced in your professional career. Do what I say! Just the fear, motivation. How many of you have experienced that autobiographically? Now, maybe they didn't physically yell at you, but the, the insinuation was, I'm the boss, you are not. If you want a job, shut your mouth and do it to the best of your ability. Would you agree some of you have experienced that autobiographically? Okay. In today's day and age, what is that motivational technique met with, typically? A, a passive aggressive resistance that usually looks something like this. Fine, sure, I'll be happy to do that. And the next opportunity I get to throw you under the bus, I'll be doing that in spades. <laughs> right or wrong? Right. So we know that's probably not effective. Ultimately, self motivation is the number one motivational technique. A human being does it because the human being wants to do it. Would you agree that's probably the best motivational technique? The challenge is, would you agree that most people in today's society are not self-motivated? Would you agree with that? Most people don't know how to put themselves into action. So the dilemma that we face as leaders is we must have a system. Now, there's a couple of different systems that were uh, techniques that we'll talk about. But, but the dilemma we've had up until now is that we think motivation is something like this. Come on now, we can do it. We can do it for the team, and we can do it for the group, and we can do it. And I know you can do it, Kelly. You can do it, Kelly! And then Kelly looks at me and she's like, I can do it. Say it, Kelly. I can do it. You can do it. I can do it. We can do it. And, ah! and then we walk on fire and we're like, yeah! Oh, that was the Oprah thing. Anyways, so we all, <laughs> you went to that. <laughs> Went to the Oprah thing. <laughs> yeah, no more Diet Pepsi. I think you should have another one. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the misunderstanding I think that most people make is that you have to be a great talker today to be a great motivator. Because somehow we have stuck in our heads that motivation comes from me talking at you. And if I talk at you strong enough, and I'm authentic and sincere enough, you'll be moved into action. Remember, motivation, that which moves me into action. That if I use fiery words, or if I'm quite articulate, or a tear comes down my eye, or there's a, a fly on a little kid's nose, right, or whatever, or a cute picture, that will move me into action. But it misses the understanding of today's society. And it misses the understanding of the context we're operating in. Most of you in this room take a, a jaded, cynical to somebody who routinely gives you a pep talk. 
You take a jaded, cynical to a person that would continually try to use little motivational techniques, if you will. It is not effective today. So then what is effective? So let me introduce to you a system. A system. Now why is it important to use a system? Because it's sequential. It doesn't take talent, ability, skill. It just takes learning and then deploying the system. Okay, first of all, motivation is just that which moves me into action. If I want to move another human being into action, the first thing I have to identify is the hot button. What is their hot button? What is that thing that moves somebody into action? Somebody give me some examples of what a hot button might be with, before I explain it. But, but just, what do, you, what do you think I mean by a hot button? What? A timeline. So, so that, that, that hot button might be consequence. What else could a hot button be? Advantages. So it could be recognition, reward, advancement, responsibility. How many of you know people in your life that they didn't want necessarily more money, they just wanted more power? The way to motivate them was, hey, Peter, do me a favor. If you do all this, I'll let you start making the schedule around here. <laughs> yes, I want to make the schedule. Right? Okay? Those are hot buttons. If I can learn Alice's hot button, Peter's hot button, uh, Callie's hot button, Crystal's hot button, if I can learn their hot button, recognition, greater responsibility, praise in public, praise in private, if I can recognize what their hot button is, I can regularly push it. Every one of you in this room has a hot button. And my first thing that I would do if I was working with you or around you is I would try to figure out what it is. How many, raise your hand if you have kids. Is this absolutely applicable in your house? And all of you have probably already done this because you're parents. You know what will get your daughter into action. You know what will get your daughter to do nothing. You know what will get your son into action. Nothing. I'm gonna, this, isn't, this is going to sound misogynistic. It, it isn't meant to be. Women in the room. Women in the room. It's a big word. Yeah. You didn't think I had it in me, did you? She's like, damn, that's a big word for the chubby brown man. Good job, Ian. <laughs> so, so listen now. Women, just women. Forget about the men. Women. As it relates to your husband or, or significant other, male significant other, would you agree with me you know how to do this? Can you move your man into action? Either move him into action through some kind of negative or move him into action with some kind of positive. How many of you know your man's hot button? I don't even know what everybody's laughing about right now. I'm not even going there. I don't even want to know. My point is you already know how to do this. If you're a parent, if you are married, you know how to observe another human being and kind of figure out what moves them into action both positively and negatively. Some of you utilize this negatively. You get negative reactions out of people. But the same is true in the workplace. How do I move Alice into action? Because remember, motivation is not a fiery pep talk. It's not being eloquent. It's just how do I move another human being into action? So what's somebody's hot button? Well, once I know recognition, advancement, money, or something else, then I've got to push it. How do I push it? And this is the clarification. See, there's motivational techniques that can lead a person to being self-motivated. Because that's what we're trying to do. Grow a human being to be self-motivated. So the first question you should ask yourself is, huh, I wonder what my hot button is. Is it recognition? Is it a pat on the back from someone I value and respect? Is it more money? Is it... Uh, a certificate. Why would it be important that you know what your hot button is? Why would it be important for you to know what your hot button is? So you know how to motivate yourself. So when the grind of life comes around 
and you get beaten down by the grind, you know how to overcome that and you can sustain because this thing is a marathon, it's not a sprint. And in the last three weeks when we talk about continuous improvement, we'll talk about some specific techniques to keep you into action and keep you moving and being at a high level of motivation longer than others. So first, so I can push my own hot button, but also to help you recognize hot buttons in other people. So step number one, what motivates me? Now once I know what Donna's hot button is, I've got to probably use some different techniques to push that hot button. And there's four of them. The first is what I call the boss method of motivation. The boss method of motivation. That is something like this. Well, I don't know what you're talking about, Donna, but I'm the boss. And at least for today, you're going to do exactly what I tell you to do because I am the boss. I got the title. I got the authority. I'm the boss, and that's it. Now, that has been utilized for thousands of years. The only difference today is you can get away with using the boss method of motivation as long as you give an explanation of why. And Donna, here's why we're doing it this way today. You're, you're, I'm not saying it's going to be totally accepted, but it's more accepted if I explain. But if you just come out of the gate, look, I'm the boss, I'm the title, that's the way it's going to be. You will be met with strong attitudinal opposition. Second technique or method of motivation. The tangible approach. Brett, I will give you $5 if you do that. I will give you $5 if you do that. I will give you $5 if you do that. I will give you, and what does he say? Does he? He says, he says, give me 10. Because it's no longer motivating to me anymore. I don't want to move into action because you've now routinely given me five. I've gotten used to five. So to move me into action now, Ian, you need to give me 10. That's the downside of the tangible approach to motivation. Then... There is what I call the good old boy approach to motivation. That sounds something like this. Joe, what's up? Role playing, Joe. Good job. Hey, what's going on, buddy? How are you? Good to see you, Joe, my man. Woo! Can you do me a favor? <laughs> next day. Next day. Joe, hey, how are the kids, buddy? Good to see you. Oh, hey, by the way, we got a deadline. Can you do me a favor? By the third day, when he sees me coming, what does he do? He runs in the other direction, right? It's like, holy crap, there's Ian. The good old boy approach, people will just do it because I'm a good person, will not sustain. It will not last. And at some point, people will know that that's what you're doing to them. How many of you know someone like that in your life? They are going to get you into action by just being good. Old person. Then the fourth, the tricky approach to motivation. Now, the tricky approach to motivation is something like this. What department do you work in? IT. IT. Brent, it's Ian up here on the seventh floor. Glenn is pissed, man. <laughs> he is hot under the collar. And I totally need someone from IT up here right now to fix my computer because I have got something on my computer that he is asking for. And he's in a meeting. He can't call you himself, and Di uh, Diane can't call you either. But I'm calling you. They told me to call you. So can you come fix my computer right now, please? And what would you say? <laughs> would you really? <laughs> would they? Okay, let's say that you're a normal IT department. <laughs> what would you, you would probably say something like, you would probably try to verify that it was Glenn that was asking. And if I gave you the reasonable, or Brian, or someone like that, if I gave you a reasonable explanation, you might move quicker than you would normally. Yes or no? Yeah. Especially if I called from his extension, which I don't know how I'd pull that off, but I'd figure out a way. Now, here's the funny thing about when, we do, when we've all done stuff. I'm, that's an exaggerated example, but follow me. The funny thing is that Glenn has nothing to do with it. I'm just bringing Glenn into the conversation because I think his authority, his image, his whatever will move Brett into action. Now, all of us have done this at home. 
Well, let me just tell you one thing. When your other parent gets home, that's why I say, you know what? I'm going to tell your mom. And my daughters are like, oh, God, don't tell mom. <laughs> or I've done this before. Yep, I've honestly done this. Yep, uh-huh, yes, yes. Okay, honey, I'll tell them. All right. Mom said you better have your rooms clean before she gets back from the store. You better get upstairs and get that room clean. <gasps> okay. Now, how many of you know that there was not even anybody on the other end of the phone? <laughs> Tricky approach to motivation. Tricky approach to motivation. This is a, even a more overt example. I was a young coach. I was very, very young. One of the youngest in the profession at the time. And I was coaching down in the States. I coached football. And we were going to play a cross-town rival in football. And I had come up with a motivational technique. I had this old beat-up car. And I had decided that I would paint the abbreviations of the other school I would spray paint it on my car and I would drive up to the parking lot on Friday afternoon because games were on Friday evenings. So I pull up the car and I knew that if the players saw all this graf graffiti, if you will, on my car, that I could use it as a motivational technique. So I just, I, PV, I, I, PV on the car, PV, 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 Palo Verde, PV, pull up. Park it in a very prominent place where all the kids are hanging out. And the kids were just like this. Coach, man, what's up with your car? I don't know what it was. But last night I heard a bunch of noise out in front of my house. And I walked outside. And there was a bunch of kids running down the street. And I couldn't really make it out, but it looked like they had jackets on that said Palo Verde. And then I looked at the car, and look, it says PV all over the car. Coach! They came to your house! <gasps> you think so? <laughs> yes! Coach, we're all going over there right now. They all started jumping in cars. I was like, no, 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 no! No, gentlemen, no violence. Save it for the field tonight. <laughs> so now we're in the locker room. True story, now we're in the locker room. And I start going off. Have I ever helped you in any way? Is there anything I've ever done for you? Have I ever made you laugh? Or have I ever given you a technique that's going to make you a better ball player? Have I ever helped you personally? Well, I'll tell you something, men. They came to my house last night. They violated my honor. They violated my family. They violated everything that I am. And if you love me in any way, you'll fight for me tonight. That's true. And I, and I said this. So every time you make a tackle, every time you make a run, I want you to look at me and tell me that that was for me and my family. It was crazy talk. Ah! They blast out there. They're hitting kids. Looking to the side like, that was for you, coach. So we win the game. Go across. Shake the guy's hand. He's like, Ian, what the was going on? I go, what do you mean? He goes, those kids were crazy tonight. Hey, a little bit of spray paint. Little technique. Now, how many of you would agree with me if those kids found out at that time that I had done that, what would be the ramifications? Would I be done? Now, that is a very overt, slightly exaggerated story, right? That's a slightly exaggerated story. But how many of you have done that? Where you have bent the truth a little bit you have exaggerated a little bit. You've inserted a name that has nothing to do with the situation, all in an attempt to move another human being into action. That's the tricky approach to motivation. I would strongly encourage you, move as quickly and as fast as you can away from that approach. But it is effective, short term. But the risks are quite significant. Don't do it. You, well, you could call it manipulation, you could call it motivation, it just moves people into action. Motivation is just that which moves me into action. And whether it's fear and intimidation, whether it's exaggeration, it's the tricky approach to motivation. Stay away from it. So, boss method of motivation. Pushing the hot button by saying, look, you will. Tricky approach. Hey, you know what, you're going to get recognized because I'll tell Glenn all about this, or I'll tell the uh, big boss all about it. Well, I was never going to tell the big boss. I don't even know the big boss. But I'm saying that to move you into action. Tangible approach. I'll give you $5. 
Good old boy, come on, Kelly, do me a favor. All of those approaches move somebody into action, and I can see why you might use that approach. Because as you look at the, as you look at the flow chart, obviously if this person knew how to put themselves into action, they would. So I might have to use those various approaches to just get them moving. Just get them moving. Because me moving them into action, what am I trying to do? Little victories lead to what? Big victories. So I might have to use one of those approaches with Alice just to get her moving. But ultimately, self-motivation will rule the day. So here's what I would suggest to you on how to motivate another human being. One, understand that human beings wants, needs, hopes, and desires. Two, help them build a plan to reach those hopes, dreams, goals, aspirations, and desires. Three, support them in that plan. Give them your time, your talent, your treasure. Give them whatever you can to help them in the plan. Four, coach them or give them advice when they stumble or celebrate when they achieve. Simple steps, man. Shannon, if Shannon has a goal or a dream, I'm his coworker. Shannon tells me about the goal or dream. I then, every time I come across an article or every time I come across a, an internet post or any time I come across information about the goal or a dream that Shannon has, if I print it off and bring it to him, print it off and bring it to him, or I, uh, I, I rip out a page because I was on Air Canada and I, I saw an article and I ripped out a page and I brought it to him, would I start to build a relationship with this guy? I might even be able to motivate him, but I'm only motivating him because I'm trying to help him reach his dream. You said, uh, you talked earlier about resonating, right? So his hope or dream, I, I try to help him reach it. I begin to resonate with him. Now, what's the, what's the key ingredients or the techniques or the better term is skill? What is the skill I have to utilize for that to be effective? Talking at him? Listening. So today, the number one motivational skill you, um, number one skill to help you be a great motivator is to listen. And that's why we've talked about it so much. So I listen to Donna's hopes, dreams, wants, and desires. I help support Donna in her hopes, dreams, wants, and desires. I, I give her advice when she stumbles. I celebrate her when she succeeds. And over a period of time, I will be a motivator to her. I can move her into action. It's fundamentally different than it was in the past. Now, obviously... When I post the video on this, when I put the video up, if this resonates with you, you want more information, watch the video. So, time. Outside the box thinking or innovative thinking, motivation, communication, all systems. You don't have to be brilliant. You just have to have a good system. All right, in the balance of our time, our time, let me introduce the analogy or the concept that we'll talk about and uses the foundation or the basis for our whole discussion of maximizing the use of your time. Why am I using the word maximizing the use of my time and not time management? Why am I not, why am I not saying time management? Why am I saying maximize the utilization of our time? What do you think the difference is between time management and maximizing the use of time. What do you think the difference is? So Joe said maximizing it would be using it to the best use. Okay, somebody else. Quick, we don't have a lot of time. So he's saying, I would utilize it in what way it makes the most sense. I wouldn't be as restrictive, perhaps. The best way to understand it is using a money analogy. So uh, what's, what's your name? Yes. Mm -hmm. What is it? Brenly. Brenly. So Brenly, can you and I play a game? Okay. Brenly, I came to your house 
tomorrow morning, let's say I come to your house. I knock on the door. You open the door. And I say to you, Brenly, I don't know if you knew, I am a great banker. In addition to doing all this other stuff, I'm also a banker. So let's role play. I'm a banker. And I said, well, you know me. You met me the other day. But I just wanted you to know I'm not a banker, and I'm here to give you something. So, Brenly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you $86,000 this morning. All of a sudden, she likes the bald man. So, Brenly, $86,000, but there'll be two stipulations. Stipulation number one, I'm going to put that money into your account at the beginning of the day. Stipulation number two, at the end of the day, I'm going to come back at midnight, just before midnight. I'm going to come back. And anything left in the positive balance, anything you haven't used on yourself, your family, given to charity, given away, whatever, anything left in the account, at the end of the day, I will take away from you. Now, Brenly, tomorrow you might, might get another $86,000. But you don't know that for a fact. The only fact that you know is I'm standing here in front of you, I'm giving you $86,000 today, and at the end of tonight, when clock strikes midnight, anything left in the account, I will debit out. Friendly, what would you do with that money? Let me, let me. <laughs> let me make it easy for you. Brenly, would you leave a dime in the account? No. Okay. All of you in the room, check this. If you don't check anything else I say, and it'll be the backdrop, the basis for our whole time conversation. Every one of you in this room gets $86,000 every day. Because there's 86,400 seconds in a day. And they're given to you as a gift to spend however you want. Time is a perishable commodity. When Brenly lays her head down on a pillow tonight, any of those $86,000 or seconds that weren't used wisely are what? Are you ever going to get them back? No. So the first step in understanding this thing called time is understanding it's a perishable commodity. So I don't manage money, right? Managing money, that's putting it at the bank and getting 1% interest. If I want to maximize my dollar, I invest it in something that gives me 5 and 6 and 8 and 10 and 12%, 15% or times return. If I put in $5, I want $10. That's investing, right? Well, time is the same way. So the analogy that we're going to use all next week is $86,000. I got $86,000 every single day. The challenge for all of us in this room is we all have a lot of roles that we play in our lives. Dad, husband, somebody's kid, employer, employee, uh, in my place of faith, volunteer board of directors, time for myself. Would you agree? And I only have 168 hours in my week. That's all I got. And it's perishable. And of that 168 hours, listen to this now. Of that 168 hours, I only have about 100 to 110 that are usable hours. Because I got to back out sleeping, I got to back out eating, I got to back, back out sitting on Franklin Avenue and going nowhere. How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Every time I come here, man, damn. Dude, somebody in public infrastructure, get me another lane, like quick. So, so listen, listen. This is all the usable hours I have. Somehow, I'm expected to do all these things in 100 hours. Impossible. How do you say impossible? Except if you talk to Archimedes, because Archimedes would say there's a force multiplier. So the force multiplier is Pareto's principle. So Pareto, another mathematician, said this. Pareto said that 80% of the stuff gets done from 20% of the activity. He called them high leverage activity. For purposes of our discussion next week, we're gonna call them high return on investment activities, or ROI, high ret return on investment. That if we are gonna really maximize the use of our time, we will look at the 100 hours, and we will say to ourselves, there are some activities that when done, Give me a greater return. Well, give me a greater return. There are some activities that when I do them, I get a greater return. There's other activities that when I do them, what? There are other activities that when I do them, I get less of a return. 
and that it's in your best interest to identify the roles that you have in your life, the goals that you have within those roles, and the, the high leverage activities. And then once you've identified those high leverage activities, make sure you block them in. And we'll talk about the technique of time blocking. Now, there's a lot of people out there talking about time blocking, but they don't do it in the context of investment. Investment. And what I call making an appointment with yourself. So there's certain activities, Joe, that you should be doing every week because that activity gets you closer to your long-term goals, husband, family member, work, whatever. But you don't usually do them because they're not urgent. Because we're all urgency addicted in this room. So I must proactively make an appointment with myself to do those activities that will give me the greatest return. And avoid those activities that will give me the less return. Pareto's principle. That 80% of the stuff gets done with 20% of the activity. So it would be in your best interest to know what that is. And then finally, that there's some fundamentals. Some fundamentals. Like the tool that you use to organize your time. Phone, smartphone, day timer, sheet of a to-do list that there are some tools that are going to be more efficient and effective for you in comparison to others. So on Monday morning, you're going to get a video. And that video is about a half hour in length. Don't, I don't expect you to watch it on Monday. I'm going to give you a couple days to watch it. So 10 or 15 minutes a day. It will take this and unpack it in a greater degree. Then on the other days, I will continue to unpack it a little bit more talking about the tool, just some reinforcement. Then I'm going to give you an exercise, and that exercise will be to track your time for a week. I'll give you a worksheet, a couple worksheets, and you'll track your time for a week. Here's the idea. The idea is, can you come up with a better system to maximize the use of your time? If you could pick up four more hours in your week, how many of you, by show of hands, would say that that would be of significant benefit to you? Raise your hand if you could pick up four more hours. Okay, That would be 16 hours in your month. If you could pick up 16 hours in your month, raise your hand if you'd say that would be of benefit. This is going to sound very harsh, and I don't mean it to. Well, I guess I do mean it to. You can't be a good dad today if you don't know how to do this. Because something will lose work, your personal life, something will lose so your kids can win. And then if you're more into those things, then your kids lose. So for, never before in the history of mankind has this been more important than today. How many of you know people who are being crushed by the guilt of letting something slip in their life? Does anybody know somebody like that? So for me, that's why we're taking a week, almost two weeks, to talk about this. Now let's bring it back to leadership. How many of you have dealt with somebody as your leader that they are completely unorganized when it comes to time? Raise your hand if you know somebody like that. Well, don't raise your hand. It's on film. They might see you. <laughs> Peter's like, I don't care if they see me or not. <laughs> Listen now. Remember, it goes back to credibility. It goes back to credibility. If you want to be a leader, well, you are leaders without titles, but if you want to be a formal leader with a title, you're going to gain more respect if people look at you and go, how are they able to get everything done that they get done and still have time for their kids? They don't come in here on Sundays. There are some people that take a 40-hour-a-week job and get it done in 60 hours. There are other people that take a 40-hour-a-week job and get it done in 35. Which one do you want to be? Because at some point, you run out of days that you can come in on your own time. Because there's only so much, $168,000 and $86,400 a day, uh, a day, 86,400 seconds in a day. I cannot overemphasize the importance of this. For, for you as a mom, for you as a dad, for you as a husband, for you as a wife, for you just your own mental health, maximizing the utilization of your time. And then also on Monday, you're going to get that little link that says, make your commitment. All right, as we wrap up, somebody tell me something you're taking away from our time today. Somebody tell me something you're taking away from our time today. It goes fast, doesn't it? It does go fast. Somebody tell me, quick, come on, we don't have all day. 
Pareto's principle, that there's certain activities that give me a greater return. And he said that 80% of the work gets done from only 20% of the activity. He really made the case. Somebody else. Somebody tell me you're taking something you're taking away from today. Okay, motivation. How do I move another human being into action? Don't forget, over the three weeks, I'll put up videos, so you got to go into the learning portal. I'm amazed that I got emails today, obviously not from you in the room. I got emails today from people saying, where can I find the archived information? What? Right? What? Learning portal. I didn't know there was a learning portal. I didn't know about that. Come on. Pay attention. Right? There's no greater substitute than just paying attention. Somebody else. Something you're taking away quickly. That's right, that, that it's not pixie dust, that I can learn to be creative. Even if you don't like the questions that I used, use some approach that's sequential and logical. Systems thinking. If you're not completely satisfied with the results you're getting in your home, in your neighborhood, in your community, in your workplace, it's probably systems-based. Thanks for your time, guys. See you later.